Well, thank you once again for joining me. Let's get right into the teaching today. And um, I want to talk to you about the war within the war within. You see, there is a lot of things happening around this world and there's a lot of things happening in this country, things that have broken our hearts, things that have hurt so many people over not just the last couple of weeks, but over the years, the problems that we've had in our nation. But we've had, we've also had the gospel spreading more than it ever has before. And we sometimes forget where the battle really is. And I want to focus on the war within, because the Bible says in Proverbs 16, 32, it says better is a man who can rule his own spirit than one who can capture an entire city. So it's one thing to capture a city, but it's even a greater thing to rule yourself. He says he who is slow to anger is better than the mighty and he who rules his spirit better than the one who captures a city. So I want you to think about that for a moment, that it would take such a great effort. It would take such a, a mammoth effort to capture a city like Chicago or New York or Los Angeles or Singapore or um, or Sydney, Australia or Istanbul or wherever you are. It would take so much to capture a city. But the Bible says it's even better for you to be able to rule yourself. It's more powerful. It makes a greater impact. It makes a bigger difference for you to rule yourself than to even capture a city. Wow, that's pretty powerful. You got a lot of power. You know that, right? You have a lot of power. And I want to share that with you so that you can tap into and unleash the power within. But you can only unleash the power within when you win the war within. And let me go give you a scripture on that as well. In James chapter four, verse one, and I want to read this to you from the NIV version of the Bible. He said, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? He said, don't they come from your desires that battle within you? Don't they come from he's really saying, don't they come from within you? In other words, whatever shows up on the outside started on the inside. You know as well as I do that the way that God transforms us is from the inside out, just the same way that a, a moth will turn into a butterfly, a, worm, a caterpillar will turn into a butterfly. He goes into his creates a cocoon around himself and inside of that cocoon, God has wired and designed that um, creature to actually be transformed from within all the everything that that butterfly is on the outside of that cocoon was all inside of that was all inside of that caterpillar from the beginning of time when that when whenever that caterpillar was born from the beginning of that caterpillar's life. Every bit of color in the wings of that butterfly, every every bit of the cells and the DNA to to be able to fly was always inside within. You see, there's greatness within you. There's treasure within you. There's power within you. There's healing within you. There's wisdom within you. There's answers within you. There's value within you. But there's also a war within you. And we're going to deal with that war within because you can't deal with the things on the outside if you don't first deal with the things on the inside. And that's why I want to talk to you about the war within. You know, it says in Ephesians chapter six, verse 12, and I'll read this to you from. Um, I think the New Living Translation, Ephesians chapter six, verse 12, he says, For we are not wrestling against flesh and blood enemies, but against the rulers and authorities of the unseen world. You see, we live in this horizontal world where we, we try to attack the enemy that we see outside of us. But he's talking about anything that ever happens, all the evil that happens in the world. It happens through people who are being influenced by evil spirits. He says evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world against mighty powers in this dark world and against evil spirits where in the heavenly places, the evil spirits are operating in heavenly places in the unseen world. You see what we see played out in the media, what we see played out in the news, what we see played out in this world has already happening 
in the heavenly in the heavenly places and it's showing up in the earthly places. The Bible says that everything happens in the spiritual world and then it shows up in the natural world. And we need to understand that so that we don't aim our spiritual weapons or any weapons for that matter at a physical enemy. Rather, instead, we take our place as sons and daughters of God and we aim at the spiritual forces that are behind the hate, that are behind the fear, that are behind anxiety, the spiritual forces that are behind bitterness, that are behind unforgiveness, the spiritual forces that are behind um, different groups that hate or cause strife or conflict. What happens is, is the heavenly places that these evil spirits are operating in. The good news is there's also somebody else in those heavenly places that has more authority than the evil spirits. And you know who that is? You. The Bible says and, and put this in. Um, I want to show you a scripture in Ephesians chapter two, verse six in the New American Standard Bible or New King James. But in Ephesians chapter two, verse six, it says, for Jesus Christ has raised us up with him and has seated us with him in the heavenly places. You see, notice he talks about the heavenly places. And if you if you look at that in the New American Standard Bible, it says heavenly places, just like it says in Ephesians chapter six, verse 12, in the heavenly places, he's raised us up with him and seated us with him where in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus and with us in the heavenly places with Christ Jesus, that gives us authority over all the power of the enemy. If you go, if you jump back over to Ephesians chapter one, verse twenty two, I think it is in Ephesians chapter one, verse twenty one, he says or verse twenty he said he's brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his own right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and over every name that is named, not only in this age, but in the one to come. So notice God has put Jesus next to him at his own right hand in verse 20, he says. And in verse 21, he says far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and over every name that is named. So obviously God, the father is on the throne and Jesus is at the right hand of the father in heavenly places, it says in verse 20 and in verse seated him at his right hand in heavenly places and verse 21, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion. And so if we're seated with Christ, who's seated with the father. Far above all rule and authority, then guess what that makes you? You are far above all rule and authority. And so we can't battle our fight with people. It's not against flesh and blood enemies. Our battle is to take our authority over the spiritual forces of darkness and over the evil spirits that are trying to control this world and trying to control our lives. And it starts with us getting control of our own self. And getting control of our thoughts. And learning how to master our emotions because there will never be healthy horizontal relationships with people until you have a healthy vertical relationship with God is everything that unfolds in the horizontal relationship begins with the vertical re relationship. And we'll get back to that in a couple of moments. But I want you to see how this works, because what we have to do is we have to understand to win the war within, we have to believe something about God. We have to believe something about the enemy. We have to believe something about ourselves and we have to believe something about others. And I want to help you to know what to believe about each of these four things. We have to know what to believe about God. We have to know what to believe about the enemy. We have to know what to believe about ourselves and we have to know what to believe about e each other and others. And once we win that battle of what we believe, the war within. Then everything else on the outside will begin to. Begin to look like what's on the inside right now, what's on the outside looks like what's on the inside, because 
Most people are confused and have chaos and fear and anxiety on the inside. So that's what shows up on the outside. Fear and uncertainty and insecurity and feelings of inferiority and 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 all of the things that are working in people's lives, condemnation and guilt and and shame and blame and anger and resentment and bitterness. All those things are are we're seeing played out on the outside because that's what's on the inside of people. And we have to realize what's behind all that are evil spirits. We have to be careful. Not just be careful, we have to have an understanding of this. Let's not demonize people because people are going to do things and we want to demonize people and find somebody to blame. But you know, we need you know who we need to demonize. We need to demonize demons (laughs) like we have to realize that the demons need to be demonized, the evil spirits. We have to see that everything that happens in this world through human beings. They are being influenced by either an evil spirit or the spirit of God. And there is a war within you for who is going to control your decision making process of your life, because real spiritual warfare is who is going to control the decision making process of your life. Are your emotions going to be in control? Is God going to be in control? Is love going to be in control or is fear going to be in control? Is goodness going to be in control and kindness or is resentment and pain and hurt and shame going to be in control? You see, because this is how we win the war within is by understanding what to believe about God, what to believe about the enemy, what to believe about ourselves and what to believe about others. And I want you to realize something, folks. There's a really clear difference between God and the devil. And you know what it is? It's going to be real spiritual. Get ready. God is good. And the devil's bad. I know that took me a long time to study and figure out and learn. And it was a big statement. (laughs) You see how it's the little things. God is good. The devil's bad. We have to be we have to realize it's that simple. If you look at John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus said the thief comes only but for to steal, kill and destroy. So anything that steals, kills or destroys, that's the fingerprints of Satan. Anything that steals, kills, destroys. Now we see the DNA of the devil. We see the DNA of Satan. We see the DNA of the thief. Jesus said, but I have come that they might have life. I love I like how the Amplified says that they might have and enjoy life and have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. Jesus said, I'm the good shepherd. Oh, there's a bad one out there. There's a bad wolf out there, the devil. But Jesus is the good shepherd who laid his life down for the sheep. And listen, we got to get a hold of this, that God is good. And here's what I want you to understand about the war within. It's a struggle. The struggle is real. The struggle people are experiencing on the outside, all the things we're experiencing, all the the shock, all the the pain, all the grief that's coming out, all the the years that we're experiencing now coming up to the surface because God wants to heal it. You can't heal what you don't first reveal. First, something has to be revealed then it can be healed. But you got to feel it. You got to reveal it and then God will heal it. But you have to look to God to heal it because man can't heal this stuff. Man can't heal a virus. Man can't heal racial tension. But God can. And God does through you when you win the war within. You see. I want you to understand something. God knows you struggle. God knows I struggle. And whatever your struggle is today, now locate yourself here. What are you struggling with? There's a struggle within. You might feel oppressed. You might feel mistreated. You might feel an injustice has been done in your life. You might be going through something physically, something emotionally, something financially, something in your relationship. Let me show you something about God that I want you to believe about him. In Hebrews chapter four, verse 15, I want to read this to you from the King James Bible. Now, Hebrews chapter four, verse 15. Notice what he says, for we do not have a high priest that cannot be touched with the feeling 
of our infirmities, but in all things was tempted like we are yet without sin. Notice what he says there. He says our high priest, which is Jesus, he said, we don't have a high priest that's not touched with the feeling of our infirmities. The word infirmity is our weaknesses, what we're struggling with. We have a high priest who's touched by it. Whatever you feel right now, it's real because you feel it. Whatever the reason is that you feel it, we can dissect that and we can understand that and we can break that down. But it's real. If you feel something, it's real to you. And God wants you to know he's touched by that. Not everybody else is going to be touched by that. Not everybody else is touched by what you feel. Not everybody else is moved by what you feel. Not everybody else is sensitive to what you feel. But God is. God is so aware of your feelings. He's not mad for you having these feelings. He's not against you having whatever feelings you have. And I'm talking about a very broad could be a spectrum of thousands of different feelings that whatever wherever you find yourself. This is how you win the war within against the infirmities, against your weaknesses, against the forces of darkness that are trying to lead you to make decisions that will destroy your life. Or God's spirit trying to lead you to make decisions that will build your life. The Lord is touched. By whatever you feel. Is it anger? It touches him. Is it fear? It touches him. Is it resentment? It touches him. Is it this feeling of mischaracterizing you? Somebody has mischaracterized your character, some misunderstood you, feeling misunderstood, feeling sick, feeling broken from life, from this crisis we've been in one crisis after another. You feel discouraged. He's touched by that. You feel alone. He's touched by that. You feel weak. He's touched by that. You feel like quitting. He's touched by that. You feel like hurting yourself. He's touched by that. You feel like hurting somebody else. He's touched by that. We've got to believe this about God. What are we supposed to believe about God? He's touched by what you feel. I want you to see this great verse. I shared last week. Grace shared it with me. It was so powerful. Isaiah 42. Verse three. In the New American Standard Bible, it says a bruised reed. He will not break. Are you bruised today? He's not going to break you. And a dimly burning wick he will not extinguish. Is your wick (laughs) run out? (laughs) Are you down to the You know, have you ever had a lighter that you just used it so much? Come on, where are my smokers out there? (laughs) Man, you flick that thing so many times it's out. It's gone. There's nothing left. Maybe your life feels that sometimes. But he says a dimly burning wick he will not extinguish Oh, that. That person's too broken. Let me just blow out their their little flame. It's not much there. So let me just blow. No, he will never extinguish. He will never put it out. There's certain candles that, you know, sometimes when they're lit in our house, I just hate the smell. And so I got it. So I do this. I lick my fingers. Boom. I put that wick out, man. But you know what? No matter what (laughs) is going on in your life, no matter how. What aroma is coming out of your candle, whatever flicker is barely coming out of your life. He will not extinguish it. He will not crush it. For he will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not be disheartened, it says. Or crushed. Until he has established justice in the earth, God's going to do it because he feels the injustice you feel he's touched by it. The fear that you feel he's touched by it. The anxiety you feel he's touched by it. The jealousy, the anguish. 
the discouragement, the devastation, the disappointment. He's touched by it all. And I love what he says in verse three of Isaiah 42 in the message Bible. Wow. He won't brush aside the bruised and the hurt. Have you ever felt brushed aside? Little brothers sometimes feel brushed aside, right? You know, the shortest person feels brushed aside. The the person who's the odd man out feels brushed aside. When everybody's popular and you're the unpopular, you feel brushed aside when everybody else is having favor and it's not working in your life, you feel brushed aside. Rejection, inferiority. All these feelings of feeling brushed aside. Where is when's your day? You feel bruised, you feel hurt. God says something about himself. He won't brush aside the bruised and the hurt, and he will not disregard the small and insignificant, but he will steadily and firmly set things right. Yes, in your life. Are you bruised? By what we've witnessed in the last two weeks and what it reveals about injustice that has been in our country and around the world. Are you bruised? He won't disregard it. He won't brush it aside. Not this time, because we're going to look to him. Are you hurt? He's not going to brush it aside this time because we're going to look to him. Do you feel insignificant, small, inferior, like my voice? How is my voice going to be heard? But God hears the faintest cry. God sees the dimmest burning wick. And he will not brush it aside. He will not disregard you. Have people disregarded you? Sure. Has opportunity disregarded you? Sure, of course. But God will not dis regard you, not you. No. He will steadily and firmly set things right. He's not going to disregard you. He's not going to brush you aside. Oh, no, I got to get to the important people. God, you're so important to him. You are so important to him. You were God's idea. You might have come through your parents. Of course you did. You came through your parents, but you came from God. You came through. That precious woman called your mother. But you came from God. You were his idea. So he knows how to heal and solve and rectify and set things right and avenge you. He's your avenger. The widow said to the unjust judge, the unrighteous judge, avenge me, avenge me. And he said, no, you're not important. You're a widow. But she would not stop. Avenge me, avenge me. And finally, he said, this woman bothers me so much, I will avenge her just so she'll stop bothering me. And then Jesus says, Think about this unrighteous judge who avenged this woman, even though he didn't respect man and didn't respect God. How much more will your father avenge his children who cry to him? Oh, it might seem like it's not happening, but he will avenge you. And it will happen so fast. It might take a while, but when it happens, It'll catch you by surprise and he will turn the tables on the devil, turn the tables on your situation, turn the tables on whatever is causing you suffering. And he will turn it around and suddenly you'll find yourself lifted up, promoted, transformed, changed. Oh, it's while it was happening, it seemed like it was taking forever. But then in an instant, in a moment of time, He turns it around. And suddenly. You feel the reward of God, You feel 
the delivering hand of God. You feel that God has steadily and firmly and firmly set things right. Oh, believe this about God. Believe this about God. He won't brush you aside. Believe this about God. He hears the faintest cry. Believe this about God. He sees it all. One of the, my favorite things about God is when I think of Jeremiah 29, 11, God says, I know. I know the plans that I have for you. I just love that he says, I know, I know. You've been through something. God knows you're feeling something. God knows no one could deliver you. God knows. How is this ever going to change? God knows he's got a plan. And it's for you. He has a plan. First of all, he knows what you're going through. Secondly, he has a plan. Thirdly, it's for you. Say that. Say God knows. Say that out loud. Say God plans. Say God knows. Say God has a plan. And his plan is for me. Yeah. Say that because it's the truth. Boy, we need to know. We need to believe this about God. Whoa. Believe this about God. You know, if you go to Hebrews chapter 4, back to verse 15, he's touched by the feelings of your infirmity. The struggle is real. What you feel is real. Hebrews chapter four, verse 15. He's touched by the feeling of your infirmity. If you guys could put the King James version up there. Thank you so much. I want you to see this word. It's important that you see this word. He's touched. When you feel something, he's touched by it. And one of two things is going to happen with what you feel. It's going to drive you to make the right decision or it's going to drive you to make the wrong decision. And that's spiritual warfare right there. When you feel something, it's going to drive you to make the right decision or drive you to make the wrong decision. What is the right decision? Look at what he says. When you realize that he's touched with the feelings that you're going through, Verse the next verse gives us the answer. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. What do we do now that we know that he's touched by our feelings? We come boldly to the throne of his grace. Let your feelings drive you to the throne of God rather than drive you to a regrettable decision that will hurt you in the end. Let your feelings drive you to God. Let your feelings drive you where? To the throne of grace. What's waiting there for you? The mercy of God, the grace of God to help you in your time of need. The world can't answer. The world can't help you. The world can't solve it. The government can't fix it. No one can redeem it. But God is there and he is waiting for for you. He's touched by what you feel. Now let it drive you to his throne. Let it take you to God. Let's go to God. Let's go to God. And what is waiting for us there? Grace and mercy and help in our time of need. That's what's waiting for you there. Where should we go to the throne? What is waiting for us there? Mercy. help and time and what you need. And how do we go there boldly? Boldly. Or we can be like Cain in Genesis chapter four. When Cain brought his offering to the Lord, the reason why God didn't accept it is because Abel brought blood. He brought an animal sacrifice. And the only thing that the only way that we can come to God is by the blood of Jesus. So when Abel took an offering of an animal and offered it to God, there was blood to wash his sins or in that case to cover his sins. 
But Cain brought the work of his hands. He's going to try to do it in his own power and his own strength. It's the flesh versus the spirit. It's the spirit versus the flesh. Abel is solving his problem with in the spirit by bringing blood to the throne of God. Cain is bringing the work of his hands. And you can't go to God based on your work, your efforts, what you can achieve. But Abel brought the first of the flock, the blood, and God respected it. But for Cain, God didn't respect his offering because it was his own works rather than the works of Jesus Christ on the cross. You see how the blood of Jesus is everywhere in the Bible, because that's how we come to God in the Old Testament is the blood of an animal. The new covenant is the blood of Jesus himself. And you know what happened when he didn't feel right with God? Look at what happens in Genesis chapter four. Now Cain is struggling. And it says. Cain became angry and his countenance fell. So now these negative emotions are trying to take control of his life and he's about to make a decision based on his emotions or make a decision based on the spirit of God. So he's got anger, he's got his countenance falling, his depression, he's dealing with depression, he's dealing with anger. And the Lord said, why are you angry? Why is your countenance fallen? He said, if you do well, will you not? Will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. See, it wasn't a sin for him to have anger. It wasn't a sin for him to be depressed. But sin is crouching at the door, ready to pounce on him if he surrenders to those emotions. And its desire is to rule you is what it means. Its desire is to rule you. Its desire is for you. Your emotions. Sin wants to control you by you giving into your emotions. But then he says, but you must master it. And let me tell you something. If Cain could master his emotions under the old covenant in the Old Testament, you can master your emotions with the power of the blood of Jesus, the power of God's word, the power of the spirit, the power of God's love, faith in God's promises. So in the midst of this emotional turmoil going on in Cain's life, God says to him, God shows up and says, why are you angry? Why? Like God starts a conversation with Cain, but Cain does not continue the conversation with God. Cain goes out to Abel, his brother. And what should have been solved in his vertical relationship with God, Cain takes out in his horizontal relationship with his brother. And it came about when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel and killed his brother. Why? Why did Cain rise up against his brother and kill him? Because he allowed the anger and the rage and the emotion to rise up within him. And he made a decision based on the emotions mastering him rather than him mastering those emotions. God comes to Cain and starts a conversation with Cain. But Cain ends the conversation with God and goes right to his brother and thinks he can solve it that way by getting rid of his brother, by killing him, by eliminating the thing that made him feel the rejection that he felt. But that wasn't really Cain's. It wasn't Abel's fault. It was the devil. Stealing, killing and destroying. But Cain gives in to the emotion and makes a decision that ruins his life. You see, God's always trying to get our attention and he always has an answer and he always has a solution. Come, come to me with what's bothering you. Go to God. Boy, you got to believe this. God wants you to come to him. Reconcile with God, work it out with him, and then you'll be an ambassador of reconciliation to others. Go to God, believe this about God. You can go to him. He's he's touched. Believe this about yourself. You got to know yourself. He says in Ephesians 1 11 in the Message Bible, for it is only in Christ that we find out who we are and what we're living for. Only in Christ we find out who we are and what we're living for. You're never going to know yourself truly until you know who you are in Christ, until you know who you are in Christ. We will struggle with our relationships because we struggle with our identity. 
But when we no longer struggle with our identity and realize who we are in Christ, in Christ, you're his son or daughter. In Christ, you're the head and not the tail. In Christ, you're more than a conqueror. In Christ, you're the righteousness of God. In Christ, you're the head and not the tail. In Christ, you're victorious. In Christ, you're well. In Christ, you're healed. In Christ, you're saved. In Christ, you have hope. In Christ, you're encouraged. In Christ, you live and move and have your being. In Christ, it's find out. It's where you find out who you are and what you're living for. And you'll waste your life and you'll abort your life and you'll abort your purpose and your destiny until you find out who you are and what you're living for and you can only know who you are when you realize who you are in Christ. I'm telling you every struggle that anybody's having with their color, any struggle anybody's having with their gender, any struggle anybody's having with their sexuality, it can only be solved just as it can only be solved in each one of us individually in Christ. For the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things are passed away and all things have become new. Verse 17, if anyone is, look at what he says, if anyone is in Christ, it's the only way to be a new creature. You must be born again. What happens, the old things are passed away, new things come. When does it come? When do these new things come? When do we come to be a new creature in Christ? Look at what he says in verse 16. We got to stop recognizing people according to the flesh, according to their age, their color, their upbringing, their past, their mistakes. We've got to stop recognizing people according to the flesh. He said, this is how you judged. This is how you came to know Christ according to the flesh, but you don't know him that way any longer. He's the risen Christ. He says we have to stop recognizing people based on their color. I know we can understand color, but we have to appreciate the diversity that God creates. There's one race, the human race. There's many diverse versions of the human race, many diverse ethnos, ethnic groups. There's many diverse cultures, there's many diverse types of people, but they're all precious to God. We've got to stop judging people or recognizing people according to the flesh. I told you three things. I told you four things. We have to believe something about God. That he's touched. That he knows that he will not brush you aside. I told you something about the enemy, what you should believe about the enemy. He's the thief and he comes to steal, kill and destroy. I told you something about you. You can only find out who you are and what you're living for when you know who you are in Christ. And now I've told you something about others. We've got to stop recognizing others by the flesh and recognize each person is God's creation. And verse 17 of 2 Corinthians 5, if any one is in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things are passed away. New things have come. Now all these things are from God. Look at what it says in verse 18, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and then gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Notice what he says here. First, God reconciled us to himself. We didn't solve it. He solved it. We didn't reconcile with God. God reconciled with us through Jesus Christ, through his precious blood, and then said, now I've reconciled you. I've reconnected you to me. I've brought peace between you and me through Christ. And now I give you the ministry to reconcile with others. You cannot reconcile with others until you know that you're reconciled by God to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, of healing, of relational connection, of value, of treasuring the preciousness of every human being. We treasure animals sometimes more than we treasure certain types of human beings. And yet God says that mankind is the crown of his creation. Animals are precious. But mankind is the crown 
the glory of God's creation. And we're we're hurting ourselves and one another when we recognize one another through the flesh, color, age, gender, sin, what's troubled that person, what that person has in their past, what that person's done. No. Let's no longer recognize one another according to the flesh. For it is only in Christ that we find out who we are and what we're living for. And it's only in Christ that we become new creatures in him. And God reconciles us to himself. And then vertically, we're reconciled to God. Now we can vertically reconcile with each other. Our fellow precious human lives, human beings. God, heal our land. 